Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content patch for the 24th of April 2013. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, Vlambeer is embroiled in controversy that some of their titles have been cloned by other developers. The next Xbox will be revealed on the 21st of May at the Microsoft campus. And 2K confirms that the XCOM shooter still lives and has, supposedly, evolved. All this and the OC Remix track of the day coming your way right now. Vlambeer, it would appear, simply cannot catch a break. The developer behind Super Crate Box, as well as Ridiculous Fishing and Luft Trousers, has claimed that a game by Rubik Labs by the name of Skyfar has, in fact, cloned their title at Luft Trousers. Now, this is a game that originally came out as a Flash title. In fact, a lot of Lambier stuff actually did. Ridiculous Fishing was based on their previous title, Radical Fishing, which was then cloned by a game called Ninja Fishing in 2011. So Radical Fishing came out in 2010. It was cloned by Ninja Fishing in 2011. And then Ridiculous Fishing came out in 2012, which was the legitimate Vlambeer title. There is also an accusation that Angry Mob, the developer of Muffin Knight, ripped off a whole bunch of mechanics as well as just the general feel of the game from Vlambeer's Super Crate Box. Now, in the case of Muffin Knight, I would clearly say that they did steal stuff from that particular game. There's no real question. They looked at it and they cloned it and they made it just slightly different, which, as far as I'm concerned, isn't necessarily enough. It was clearly a ripoff of someone else's work. Rami Ishmael from Vlambeer actually said on the subject of Muffin Knight that they played it and they did in fact make some effort to differentiate the titles. However, it is clearly a game that was heavily inspired by Super Crate Box. There was, of course, however, the case of Ninja Fishing, which was little more than an outright clone by a company called Game Nought. In that case, all they did was change the shooting mechanic for a Fruit Ninja style slashing mechanic. Even the upgrades within the game were pretty much identical. So that's not exactly great. And as a direct result, that actually delayed the release of Ridiculous Fishing, which is unfortunate because that's actually a really fun iOS game. One of the only ones that I enjoy playing on a reasonably regular basis. And now, of course, we have Skyfar. Hmm, Skyfar. So, the question is just how close is Skyfar to Luftrousers? Now, I have played Luftrousers, so I am aware of what's going on with that game. And if you were to watch the official trailer to Skyfar, which I can show you in the background, the game looks ridiculously similar in terms of the way that the game handles in terms of the way that the weapons are designed, in terms of the graphic style. There is absolutely no question that this game is cloned from Luft Trousers. I look at it and I see exactly the same mechanics, I see exactly the same style of gameplay and exactly the same handling that I experienced playing with Luft Trousers. Now, in the case of that title, Vlambeer has decided not to release that game on iOS because they believe the controls simply cannot work properly and as a direct result, they've decided to port it to PS3, Vita, PC, Linux, and Mac instead. And that will actually be out fairly soon. I do have a video of that particular title from PAX, in fact, that was a solo commentary. I'll be releasing that video closer to the launch of that game. But this is starting to get ridiculous. I've said this many times before, that gaming and genres are based on iteration of existing concepts. This is true. There's no real question about that. However, there is an absolutely massive difference between iterating on existing concepts and improving them and just wholesale ripping off an entire game. Now, if you look at Skyfar versus Luftrousers, then you can very clearly see that Skyfar is taken pretty much whole cloth from that game. I, they didn't even try to change the graphic style of it. It's actually pathetic. They used a slightly different color and regardless of that, it still looks the same. Hell, if you'd even HD'd it up to some degree, then people might have forgiven you, because at least you put some work into the art, but they didn't even do that. It's absolutely ridiculous. That is the line that you have to draw. However, the question then becomes, who decides it and who enforces it? Well, the DMCA does give some protection to this kind of stuff. 
Bear in mind that game mechanics are not inherently considered to be protectable intellectual property. So a cover system, for instance. You can't go to another company and say, oh, you can't use our cover system. That's a game mechanic. That's something that's considered to be inherent to software and the way that software works and is developed. So thankfully, you can't go and patent that. You can't claim it as your intellectual property. However, there's a difference between that and then obviously just cloning the game in its entirety and changing a few things around. And at that point, the DMCA does come into play. And I know Vlambia is going after this game in a pretty big way. And they should. As we saw with EA versus Zynga, big publishers don't like it. And as a result, they got into a big scuffle over it, big legal battle. Unfortunately, it was settled out of court kind of sucks actually they you know they quietly resolved it and as far as i know as a result they haven't set any kind of precedent which really sucks it would have been nice to actually see a high profile case go one way or the other in court have it be public and then say look here we go there's now legal precedent for this I would love to see that, but right now I don't believe it exists. There may be some more obscure cases that could be used in that regard, however. Just bear in mind that companies like Vlambia can't really afford big legal battles, and there's also a big risk of a large company like Zynga cloning games by smaller people, as we saw with Nimblebit's Tiny Tower, uh, Dream whatever, I don't even know what it was called, Dream Tower or something like that. Whatever the case, Zynga ripped off that game whole cloth as well, and how can Nimblebit really afford to pursue a company of that size? iOS right now is the wild west as is android in this regard the thing is that since ios is more popular in terms of its marketplace it is ripe for this kind of thing it's interesting that apple is willing to enforce ridiculous rules that stifle creativity when it comes to dealing with games that for instance deal with political topics or anything remotely controversial but they have no interest whatsoever in policing clones this is really unfortunate and as a direct result it may mean that companies just start to stop producing ios games and i don't blame them for that at all but the thing is you can still steal a game you can still rip off the concept without it being an ios game originally radical fishing was a flash game which was then nicked by this other company to make ninja fishing and then we have the same thing here with luft trousers so I can't imagine that Apple is going to be too quick to enforce rules in that regard, considering the game isn't even on their service to begin with. It's difficult, isn't it? And in this case, I think the only thing you can do is just raise awareness. If you are a gamer, if you like Flambia's stuff and you dislike this cloning culture, raise awareness. Make sure that people know. You would be surprised how damaging low ratings on iOS actually can be. They will cause you to skip over the game entirely if you see that it has a low number of stars. And honestly, when it comes to cloning video games, that is a very valid reason to rate that low. It really, really is. That is a part of the industry which needs to be destroyed. And of course, originality is an important part of game development. Major Nelson has announced that the next Xbox reveal is set for the 21st of May at the Microsoft campus. There is an invite going out to press, uh, which says that Don Matrick and the Xbox team invite you to the Xbox campus for a special unveiling. A new generation revealed. So, yeah, it's hashtag Xbox reveal. It will be the next Xbox. So that'll be going on at 10 a.m. in Redmond, Washington on May the 21st. Finally, took long enough, didn't it? It really, really did. The presentation will be streamed live on Xbox.com, Spike TV in the US and Canada, as well as Xbox Live. So we will be able to actually watch that. Always good to see. And it's at that point that we will find out whether or not this bloody thing actually is going to deliver in terms of game development and game quality. If we see stuff like Always on DRM, a focus on television content and entertainment that is not gaming related, then I personally will not be all that excited about it. I feel the PlayStation 4 has had a massive PR lead as a direct result of that. But if we are entering a situation where Microsoft is changing its focus to the general family media center over a core gaming console, then to me that's actually kind of a good thing. That means that we will have a situation where there is clearly a console designed for the kind of demographic that I'm a part of, so I will be getting that console and 
we will hopefully be seeing cool game development on that machine with more casual stuff relegated to other systems. I am okay with that happening, by the way. I really, really am. What I'm not okay with, of course, is the notion that the PlayStation 4 might have a monopoly in terms of core gamers when it comes to consoles. That would not be good. Sony is... A company that can be extremely arrogant at times. I feel they have been eating a large helping of humble pie lately, which is a very, very good thing indeed. However, we are entering a situation where that could very, very easily be reverted if they didn't have any legitimate competition in the next generation of console hardware. We'll be finding out on May the 21st, folks, and no doubt you will be receiving an entire show on the conference for that. I will be watching that like a hawk. A little bit of a short show today, folks. That's just the way of it. It's been ridiculously hectic over the last couple of days, so I haven't had a lot of time. But what I can tell you is the XCOM shooter is indeed happening. So it's what we expected to have occurred once everything disappeared off the map when it came down to the original XCOM FPS, which never ended up coming out there from 2K Marin. However, over the last couple of days, various press outlets have received mysterious boxes, which are clearly designed to be marketing material for the XCOM game, and of course we reported on the acquisition of the domain names associated to the term The Bureau and what happened in 62. 2K Marin has now revealed on its website that the game has been rebranded to the Bureau, and it will be a squad-based tactical shooter that has, quote, undergone an evolution since we last saw it at E3 in 2011. 2K continued to say that Firaxis's critically acclaimed turn-based strategy XCOM Enemy Unknown has reignited the classic franchise, and we feel the time is right to deliver a new experience within the world of XCOM. 2K claims that they have refined their vision, and as a result, the game has evolved into a high-stakes narrative experience imbued with the core XCOM concepts, which is very, very interesting indeed. 2K, of course, were the guys that created Bioshock 2, which is a pretty damn reasonable piece of resume, as far as I'm concerned. I like the notion that it's somehow loosely connected to XCOM without actually being XCOM. I feel that if you branded this XCOM, then you severely disrupt the interest in that particular franchise. This is something that has been redeveloped and redone by Firaxis for better or worse, and there will hopefully be something else that comes along those lines. However, bear in mind, of course, that XCOM Enemy Unknown is very much a futuristic title. The Bureau, on the other hand, is anything but. To be honest, I find the notion of setting this in an earlier time period with lower tech stuff to be a far more interesting experience. I think XCOM is only terrifying until you start to develop some seriously advanced gear, which doesn't take a lot. I mean, if you go up to laser weapons and you're able to blow your way through walls and melt trees, the game suddenly becomes somewhat less terrifying even though it's still very, very difficult. If you're talking about setting it in the 60s when weapon technology is way, way weaker and you're talking about having to use strategy, tactics and cunning against a far superior and terrifying enemy, that is a really cool idea and that actually stays more true to the core XCOM experience than XCOM Enemy Unknown does. This is something that another game by the title of Xenonauts is actually trying to do right now, developed by a company called Goldhawk Interactive. You can actually, I believe, play the alpha or the beta of that game right now. They were trying to make the same thing, but they were setting it kind of in the Cold War, which is an interesting idea as far as I'm concerned. This is cool, man. I, I'm actually kind of excited about this. I went back in 2010, 2011, when I saw this title, I was like, uh, what? This is not the XCOM we really wanted. But now it's a case of, yeah, I actually would like a tactical shooter. Thank you. We don't get a lot of them. That would be pretty nice. So I am fairly confident that this might not suck. I'll be interested to see how it develops. Hopefully it's really, really good. Okay, folks, that wraps me up for the day. Sorry again for the shorter content patch today. It has been a very hectic few days. We did just announce a big tournament. We're going to be doing a $10,000 StarCraft tournament by the name of Shoutcraft America, featuring 16 of the top North, South, Central, and, of course, Canadian-American players. Canadian-Americans, they're going to kill me for that. Oh, man, yes. Basically, anyone on continental US is eligible to qualify based on their Grandmaster ladder ranking. So, needless to say, we've been just a little bit busy as well as trying to keep up with the regular stuff. So, thanks for your patience thanks very much for watching and to play us out we have another track here from ocremix.com all of these tracks are free to download which is always something i would strongly recommend that you do now big giant circles is probably one of the most influential composers and remixes over on oc remix and i very much like his work huge fan of it 
And he was also responsible in part for some of the music that you hear in the background of this particular show. Yes, indeed. We use OC Remix as part of this show. It's always been the background music for it, so it is completely understandable, of course, that we would then point you to the full tracks. What better way to play us out than a collab between Big Giant Circles and Zircon? Zircon is a guy who I absolutely love. He's got fantastic tracks on OC Remix and he does a lot of his own solo work. Some of my favorite music of the last couple of years has been done by Zircon. So a collab between both of them is kind of a match made in heaven. And this is a track from Final Fantasy 7. The name of the track is Every Story Begins With A Name and it is taken from the track Opening Bombing Mission. The original composer for this, of course, was Nobu Uematsu, and Final Fantasy VII is an iconic game with an iconic soundtrack. This was actually part of an OC Remix album called Voices of the Lifestream. You can click the link in the description below this video to download this track for yourself. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.